Lewis. I'm at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Um, and I'm chair of the education committee for ISOL. I'm very excited to um, introduce our second webinar. As a refresher, ISOLs are sponsoring webinars every third Tuesday of the month. Um, and the topics will really vary. Um, and this morning, I'm happy to introduce Manesh Agarwal, who chaired uh, and will moderate today's seminar. Thank you so much, Manesh. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar series. I hope uh, everybody is going to join in and find this uh, very interesting. This particular webinar, uh, we've tried to keep it uh, very useful. This and we hope that uh, they will have some tips which will benefit them. Now we know that uh, using recycled tumor bone has been going on since uh, many, many years. In fact, I think probably for this extracorporeal radiation and reimplantation was first done more than 40 years ago. But somehow very few cases have been done. There's not too much data uh, in literature. So we thought that uh, we should present this particular technology before everybody because uh, we've had now more than uh, 15 years of experience on it and we find this to be an extremely useful method of reconstruction and can be out of trouble in lots and lots of situations as we'll show you from our experience. So we've got uh, 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 people who've got a lot of experience in this technology talking today. And we'll first begin with uh, Ajay Puri, who will uh, present the Tata Memorial Hospital experience. Ajay, you can share the screen and start. Hi. Good day, everyone. Uh, Manish is still coming as host of disabled participant screen sharing. So you need to make that possible. So anyway, uh, while Manish makes the screen sharing possible, I'm going to just talk about the uh, Tata Memorial well, Hospital. I think the Sorry? You can share your screen now. It's all ready. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Is that seen now, Manish? No, yes. Now only you, no, your screen is still not visible. Screen is still not visible because I've enabled screen sharing. So no. let me check that out again. Yes, now we can see. Now you can see the screen. Perfect. So we're going to be speaking, as Manish said, on about reimplanting sterilized tumor bone, essentially treated with radiation. So it's called extracorporeal radiotherapy or ECRT. So when we talk about ECRT, and as Manish mentioned, it not being too common, the questions that you ask are, where can you do it? Why do you do it? And how do you do it? So the where is generally for intercalary resections. That means resection, which does not include the intra-articular areas of bone and it's joint sparing at both ends to the diaphysis. This is the general norm. There will be exceptions, and we cover that also during the course of this talk. So where do you don't do it? Bones with pathological fractures. That's quite logical because you're re-implanting and putting the bone back. So you don't want a structurally weak bone put back. And obviously, where the diaphysical tumor extends so close that you need to do an osteoarticular resection. Why do you do it? When you compare it to the alternatives, it has certain benefits. Diaphysical implants need a definite amount of residual host bone after resection for fixation. They are subject to subsequent loosening, wear, breakage. There is an issue about availability and expense in certain centers. When you talk about they are limited by their availability. And in children, it's a challenge getting size matched allograms. There are limitations in oncology, biological, inexpensive reconstruction option for any other tumor. We do a wide resection of the tumor. 
we then clean the soft tissue on a separate trolley where the bone wrap it in a sterile pack or vancomycin soap packs and then send it for radiotherapy to dr laskar who is going to be speaking after me and we at tata memorial hospital use a radiation dose of 50 day so this is how it is reimplanted back you can see the x rays post op and 12 years later how the bone is continue to grow and that is the boy's function this is cricket which is religion for india and played by boys all across the country this is a case of ewing sarcoma a diaphyseal lesion exception to the rule though i said that we don't do it for osteoarticular resections in the upper limb we occasionally use that because we have found that the radiation really doesn't impact on the joint function because the collapse is not that much it's not a weight bearing bone so this is the reimplanted bone after ecrt you can see post operatively that's the union site and 5 years later how well it has united the shoulder function is going to be because of what you have been able to preserve muscle or the nerves or not but structurally this is as good as any implant or a space that you may use what about the tata memorial 10 years ago we use it as a stand alone reconstruction unlike some centers who actually combine it with a vascularized fibula we've done more than 150 cases predominantly diaphyseal intercalary resections we've published our data also in various publications and this is another example of an extra articular or resection which we did you can see that the extent was almost up into the proximal ulna but we could do an osteotomy saving the joint radiated the bone fixed it back like any ulna fracture with tension band wiring we always put a strut or a plate across the radiated bone because this bone is structurally weaker than native bone and therefore we'd like to protect it for some semblance of time and you can see the function what have been our results the adequacy of resection which we generate with margin with narrow scoopings and ink soft tissue margins we've been lucky all margins have been uninvolved in histopathology one of the complaints or limitations of ecrt is because you are reimplanting the bone you cannot gauge the post chemotherapy tumor necrosis we don't think that's really too important because we don't modulate our treatment or subsequent treatment based on what the chemotherapy necrosis is we've had 10% local recurrence like in any other cases where we've used implants or other things all the local recurrences have been in soft tissue not radiated bone if you look at our union data metaphyseal osteotomies 91% of cases united without secondary intervention the mean time to union was about 6 months it is at the diaphyseal end that you occasionally have problem we've had 70% uniting without secondary intervention and the mean time to union is close to 12 months based on our experience some of the suggestions that we can offer are that the addition of a small second plate at the diaphyseal site which gives compression and using autographs at index surgery may hasten the time to union what are the complication we face with an ecrt graft infection is there just like in allografts we've had graft fractures but these fractures occur late the median time to fracture has been close to 5 years 25% of our grafts had to be ultimately removed either because of infection fracture non union or local recurrence so if you look at our graft survival at 5 years it's 79% if you look at graft survival excluding local recurrence as the cause it's close to 85% there was a recent article published a few months ago by the japanese group that looked at long term graft survival and they have showed that their graft survival is 77% at 15 years if you look at our graft survival of 79% at 5 years that means once the graft crosses that initial period it really doesn't sort of deteriorate too much so you have close to almost between 75 80% graft survival we try to go one step ahead at looking at ecrt graft we look at whether reimplanting the irradiated bone actually changed thought came because there were articles that said when you used cryo bone it actually could impact and help survival because there was an antigen effect of the tumor so we looked at 720 consecutive operated osteosarcomas 8% of them were diaphyseal 
and 40% of them had re-implanted bone. We compared this group against the other diaphyseal group where we had used other techniques other than re-implanting bone. When we look at local recurrence, Yes, the re-implanted bone seemed to have more local recurrence, but as I said, this was in soft tissue. When we looked at distant recurrence, the segment of re-implanted bones seemed to be doing better, though not statistically significant. And similarly for overall survival, there seemed to be a trend, though it was not significantly there. So that means there is a potential that if we could do a propensity match scoring and look at whether re-implanting radiated bone actually impacts survival, we may get some surprising results. So to conclude, ECRT is oncologically safe. It offers a biological durable resection option for diaphyseal resections. It is convenient, inexpensive as to whether it can actually impact on survival. I think this is an avenue for further study that we need to look at a multi-group collaboration. Thank you very much. Manish, you can stop my screen sharing and go back to. Manish, you are on mute. You have to unmute yourself, please. We can now ask uh, Lee to present uh, the Birmingham experience. How, how does it compare with uh, the other methods of reconstruction? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Lee Jays. I'm a bone tumor surgeon in Birmingham. Um, as you know, we're pretty academic in Birmingham, so we publish about 25 papers uh, a year. And sometimes I enjoy doing uh, endurance events, but not often while I'm doing them. So, the question is, uh, is this... Uh, voodoo, or uh, does it? Can you get good results with uh, irradiation and reimplantation? So in Birmingham, we have predominantly uh, been into heavy metal over the years. Uh, so about three quarters of our patients will get some metallic prosthesis, and historically, only about ten percent of our patients would get a uh, biological reconstruction. About three percent have an amputation and overall amputation rate of about 15%. So we know that reimplantation of bone is a very interesting concept for the reasons that AJ has talked about. We use the patient's own bone and there are lots of ways to uh, sterilize it, but we're talking mainly about radiotherapy uh, today. And of course, the adv main advantage is there's less sizing problems uh, than allografts. Uh, we've got done 75 cases of irradiation reimplantation uh, in the uh, um, uh, Birmingham. So how do we do it then? Well, we excise the tumor with a wide margin as uh, planned uh, preoperatively, and then we remove the soft tissue and the tumor, uh, send the specimen for histology uh, to get an idea of uh, confirmation diagnosis and some idea about response to histology. And then we put the bone wrapped in vancomycin uh, soaked swabs, uh, but we don't have uh, radiotherapy on site in our hospital. We're a purely surgical hospital. So we have to send it about two miles down the road and uh, we give our patients about 90 grays of radiotherapy. And when I asked Rob Grimer why we give 90 grays, he said, well, when we started, nobody really knew what the right dose was. And there were some papers that said they should be 300 grays. Some people, patients said they should be uh, 50 grays. So we just chose somewhere in the middle. And we've always used 90 grays of radiotherapy. And then we re-implant it into the patient. So this is a typical case in the mid shaft of a, a, a tibia with an adamantinoma. You can see here that we've uh, uh, reset the tumor. Then it goes off in the box, sterile, double wrapped in, in sterile dressings uh, with the volume of the box filled um, with uh, swabs. And then it goes off to radiotherapy and then it comes back. And you can see here we've prepared the graft, uh, in this case, to accept a fibula. 
Um, and here we can see in a pediatric case, it was uh, put back in. So the graft fits slightly, but unfortunately the plates don't because we don't have uh, such good plates for pediatrics. But you can see that over a period of time, the fibula has regrown because we left the periosteum behind. And we found in our series that happened in about 60% of pediatric cases. Um, so what were our results in the tibia then? Uh, we published the 15 patients. Um, the mean follow-up was uh, just under five years. Uh, mean time to weight bearing was, uh, again, around about uh, uh, just short of six months. Uh, complete radiological union, again, at 42 weeks, so around about nine to ten months. Uh, but of the 15 patients, uh, seven patients required further operations in the tibia, uh, four for se uh, uh, flap uh, surgery afterwards. But their good uh, function was seen with 27 out of 30 uh, on the MSTS score. And our results were comparable in terms of union and complication rates to allografts in our series. So the other place that we tend to use it is in the pelvis. Uh, we looked at 18 patients who had it done in the pelvis. Uh, again, a mean follow-up of about 50 months. Uh, nine out of uh, the patients unfortunately died of metastatic disease, which is probably an indicator of uh, the, the type of disease we see in the pelvis. Uh, we had recurrence in three patients who all died of their disease, unfortunately. But again, like uh, AJ mentioned, we haven't had problems with recurrence in the regenerate, only in the soft tissues. We had deep infection in three out of the 18. Two, people, uh, two patients uh, had uh, removal and one patient had an, uh, a hindquarter. And again, the MSTS score was uh, reasonable 77 in the 16 patients we were able to follow up. So I want to show you some cases in the pelvis. This is a, a case of a very large, low-grade uh, chondrosarcoma, sarcoma, mainly a surface tumour. We removed it with a uh, navigated resection. Uh, so here you can see the whole pelvis has been removed. But as it's a surface tumour, we were able to uh, irradiate that and uh, put it back in uh, with fixation in 2012. And you can see that um, eight years later, the graft is still holding up, but there is a lot of heterotopic ossification. The patient has no pain, good function, but the hip is ankylosed. Rob Grimer, uh, my hero, he um, started doing this. This is a case of, uh, of a parosteosis, uh, uh, pelvic osteosis sarcoma, sorry, done in at the age of 14. And you can see that though the graft has held up, there's had lots of subsequent reconstruction. Uh, but 21 years later, uh, the, the lady, young lady now has had a baby and uh, Rob is very lucky to get a 21-year-old uh, a bottle of whiskey uh, for his efforts. But this is some of the problems we've seen with pelvic uh, uh, radiation reimplantation. So this was a young patient uh, in their 20s that had this uh, chondrosarcoma again. And uh, when it was put in, uh, within two years, we started to see infection and graft reabsorption. But you can see that the, the graft has united. At this stage, the patient's function was reasonable. But uh, a couple of years later, the graft uh, reabsorbed very quickly. And uh, had to have a salvage procedure with uh, uh, um, uh, cementation, uh, but it's still going on just, but probably not the result that we wanted to. So graft reabsorption in the pelvis and weight bearing, zone, uh, especially associated with infection, is a problem. One of the best places that we, we use it is in the femur and the tibia. So we looked at six patients who had it done in the femoral diathesis, um, 27, uh, 23 centimetre resection, on average about 60% of the uh, femur. No fracture or uh, infection in this group. Uh, and in this group, they all had um, cementation of the uh, fracture. We had uh, delayed union at one uh, site, non-union in one patient. Um, one patient ended up getting converted to a rotation plasty, but this was because they had poor necrosis um, and uh, that was for a tumour control where the function is very good 
in these patients. So here's a Ewing's of the femur I did in 2011. You can see we navigated the resection, removed the uh, tumour, um, and this is the initial uh, post-op X-ray. Uh, and you can see that the bone has continued to grow from the epiphyses. Um, again, can I come back to us. Okay. Good function, and uh, you can see now um, uh, nine years later the function remains very good. Some unusual indications in the proximal humerus. This is one of Rob's cases, and you can see that ten years later the distal humeral um, uh, has united uh, and remains uh, with good function. Again, some unusual indications. This was an intraarticular Ewing, so we did a uh, extraarticular resection uh, and reconstruction for that, again, with uh, good functional results. So just a little bit of uh, biology. We did do some very basic bi basic science tests to see whether um, the radiotherapy was effective with 90 grays. So this was a chondrosarcoma, the proximal humerus. Uh, we curetted out the tumour and we sent some of the tumour to be irradiated with the bone and we sent some of the tumour uh, directly uh, to the lab. Um, we found that the uh, after breaking the tumour cells down, we could find that we couldn't grow the ones that had, had radiotherapy, we could grow the ones that didn't have radiotherapy and these continued to grow uh, from the cells that didn't have radiotherapy, but we never could grow the cells that did have radiotherapy on multiple passages uh, using uh, live cell imaging. So we, we concluded then that the uh, 90 gray of radiotherapy does appear to kill uh, even slow growing cells like chondrosarcomas. So I think in conclusion then, um, uh, extracorporeal radiotherapy works both biologically and clinically. The graphs uh, cancer from infection and reabsorption. I think there is a, qu a question about what the correct dose is. In our hospital, it does add a significant extra time, about three hours, because we don't have on-site radiotherapy. In the last few years, we've moved more to allografts, but having reviewed our results, I think uh, it's something that's a very useful technique. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. Uh I think uh, there were some wonderful points there. I think these studies which have uh, shown that radiation has uh, actually been effective in controlling the tumor cells would go a long way for people to be more accepting of this procedure. So in continuing with this uh, biology, we'll now ask Siddharth Laskar, who is the radiotherapist at Tata Memorial Hospital, to talk to us about the whole basis how much radiation do we need and what is its effect on the bone? Siddharth, you can go ahead. Yeah, I hope I'm audible. Am I audible? You need to be a little louder, probably. Yes, you're audible. You can go ahead. Just speak okay. a little yes. louder, please. Okay. So, so good evening um, to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. So my task is to try and dissect uh, what is the biological basis of extracorporeal radiation. And I'll try to uh, address the issues regarding uh, the optimal dose of radiation and the possible impact of doses of radiation on the mechanical aspects also. So what, why do we radiate the bone to a particular dose? The intent is to eradicate all viable tumor cells while we maintain the structural integrity and also allow uh, reintegration of the uh, irradiated bone segment uh, after the radiation therapy has been, uh, radiation has been done. So do we have data uh, to say, to tell us what is the most optimal dose that would cause uh, sterilization of the tumor cells? So this paper is from 1981. It's an interesting study on 18 uh, histologically proven osteogenic sarcomas, which are supposed to be radio resistant. These patients uh, received radiation therapy to doses ranging from 32 gray. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Laskar, your, your, your slides are not going through. You have to pass the slides, please. You have to set it on the presentation mode yep. and, go on, and pass the slides, please. Yeah, you'll have to go on to the presentation mode. 
Siddharth, yeah. and then keep forwarding the slides. Can you see the slides now? No, we can't see it in the presentation mode. Okay. You need to press that play button and. Can you see now? Sir, we can see your first slide, but they are not moving. So you need to go into. Or, or you can just do it manually share. by by pressing in, in every slide that you are talking. I'll just uh, reshare the slides. Is that okay now? Put it in the presentation mode. One second. One second. That's fine. Now go ahead. Yes, yeah. Maybe? yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So, so as I as I said, the primary aim is to eradicate all the viable malignant cells, uh, and while we maintain the structural integrity, and also allow the dose to be such that it allows optimal reintegration of the bone once it is reimplanted after radiation. So the question is, uh, do we know what is the optimal dose uh, that is required to sterilize at the same time, uh, maintain the structural integrity of the bone? So this paper is from 1981, uh, and uh, we have 18 histologically proven osteogenic sarcomas uh, where definitive radiation was done to a dose of uh, ranging from 3,200 centigrade delivered over 10 days uh, to almost 10,000 centigrade over uh, over um, almost about 70 days. So what was found after an amputation that was done at six months uh, was that patients who received uh, less than 3,200 centigrade uh, had viable cells, all the cells were viable, whereas the patients who received doses more than 10,000 centigrade fractionated dose had no viable cells. Between this range, there were few viable cells seen as demonstrated in this curve. Now, if you put this uh, and compare with the standard doses of radiation that we use in the clinic, uh, with X-rays, one would use about 70 to 72 grays uh, of X-ray radiation for treating osteogenic sarcomas. Whereas if you're using protons and carbon ion, you would use probably in the range of 66 to 70 gray cobalt equivalent. So this is fractionated dose of radiation therapy. So what is seen is that with fractionated radiation above 10,000 centigrade, there is no viable osteogenic sarcoma cells seen. So as we have discussed, there have been doses that have been reused in the range of 50 to 300 gray in a single fraction and that is what it is used in extracorporeal radiation. So the question is are higher doses better for tumor eradication and the second thing is what is the impact of radiation doses on the bone structure and reintegration of bone. This is the paper where the authors, the, the clinicians uh, used the highest dose that has been given till now, that is 300 gray in one fraction. And this was uh, done for proven bone malignancies, 107 patients, patient underwent surgery, ECRT, and you can see there in the histological types, they had all three, osteos, chondros, and Ewing's. So dose was delivered using a 10 MeV photon radiation and uniformly delivered to the bone fragment. A bone segment. When they looked at the disease control, the disease control was 100%. 
they did not have any relapses in the irradiated bone. But when they looked at the graft healing and non-urine rates, at two years, the graft healing was 62% and at five years, it is 64%. That means there were some grafts that failed after 300 gray of single fraction radiation. The second problem with this dose of radiation was that the incidence of non-union was 11%. So it looks like although 300 gray would sterilize the bone of the disease, but there is a likelihood that it would cause complications in terms of uh, wound healing and graft union. So we just compiled a list of uh, publications and looked at what dose was delivered and what were the major findings. So if you look at these studies where they used 300 gray as a single fraction, the disease control was good within the bone, but there was a problem of increased complication rates. Whereas most other studies would use 50 gray of radiation and it looks like the disease controls is more or less same whereas the complications are slightly lesser compared to what you would see with 300 gray and this is what Ajay mentioned about our experience with 70 patients we gave 50 gray our recurrence rates was 10 percent but they were all outside in the non-irradiated uh, bone and in, in the soft tissue and the infections and non-union rates were 12% and 20% respectively. Our graft survival was much higher than the previous study that I showed you, uh, uh, our survival rates being 84%. Now, what happens to the structural integrity of the bone? And this is again another interesting lab study where human cadaveric specimens were used and the bone fragments or the bone segments after radiation or no radiation were evaluated for the strength, ductility, fracture and toughness. And this was compared to no radiation with 50 gray of radiation and 25 kilogray of radiation and above. What were the findings? The findings showed that there was severe dose dependent degradation of strength after 35 kilogray. And this is much higher than the dose of radiation that we give uh, around 50 to 60 gray. Now, there were lesser deflections, which means the plasticity and elasticity were actually reduced in these patients, uh, in these uh, bone uh, uh, segments that were radiated to these doses. And the most important thing that was found was that 50 gray of radiation causes the same kind of damage like or it doesn't cause any damage compared to unirradiated bone. So 50 gray seemed in this study like a non-harmful radiation dose in terms of uh, the mechanical stability of the bone. Another study uh, on, on bovine tibia that were harvested and radiated to doses ranging 25 to 300 gray, they were, they were looked, tested for their uh, viscoelastic properties the Young's modulus, the Strong's modulus, and the Loss modulus. But then the conclusion was that there was no definite relationship between irradiation dose and moduli. So it is a bit controversial whether high radiation doses do really cause problems. But there were other issues that need to be kept in mind when you are interpreting these results. There was no definite relationship between dose, elastic, plastic, uh, and viscoelastic properties until 25,000, uh, 25 kilogram, which is a very high dose. The other thing is that when these parameters were tested, they were tested in animal bones and they, that may not be completely uh, replicable uh, on human bones. There was no bone mineral density done in these bones and the long-term effects are unknown because they were done in the lab. So what about studies done in humans? This is a study again from Ames. So here, patients with Ewing sarcomas were given a single fraction dose of 50 gray and the pre-radiation and post-radiation parameters in terms of bone stability and bone strength were evaluated so using these methods of plastic deformation, energy dissipation, uh, the bone stiffness was evaluated using uh, indentation modulus and so on. But what was found is that there was reduced mineralization and calcium content in the radiated bones. So there was some impact. And the other thing that was significant was that 
the patients with uh, younger uh, age, physicians were younger in age, had a uh, more higher impact of uh, radiation in their resected bones. So besides the uh, wound strength in terms of, or the bone strength in terms of uh, plasticity and elasticity and fractures, the other things are uh, regarding avascular necrosis, and uh, there were uh, there were uh, the other things that need to be kept in mind was regarding remodeling of the graft, uh, which is limited, and the problem uh, is uh, regarding the lack of histopath unless you are sending the margins of the bone from uh, the resected specimen for histopath analysis. So these are the other things that need to be kept in mind when you are radiating uh, using ECRT. There was some. Uh, study, uh, there was some uh, research still uh, looking at the differences in outcomes in terms of local control and complications using other modalities like uh, liquid nitrogen, which freezes the bone fragment. And uh, what was reported in this study, which was not uh, very old, uh, uh, ECRT to a dose of 150 to 300 in single fraction compared to freezing uh, in 85 patients what was found that there was no difference in the union till 18 months. There was no difference in tumor recurrence. The graft related complications were same and the survival was same. There were other studies which looked at other parameters like bone morphogenetic protein. And looking at that, when they compared uh, extracorporeal radiation versus liquid nitrogen, there seemed to be a, 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 a better uh, outcome in terms of bone uh, strength for, uh, for the specimens that were treated with liquid nitrogen. So to summarize, ECRT seems to be an effective method on reconstruction of bony defects post-surgery. Single dose of 50 gray, which is equivalent to 25,000 centigrade of fractionated radiation, results in effective tumor eradication. Higher doses do not seem to be necessary for tumor eradication, and there seems to be a structural integrity and reintegration uh, superiority in, page, in, uh, in bones that were radiated to 50 gray as compared to 300 centigrade. So the bottom line is probably 50 gray is good enough and it helps in eradication of disease while at the same time uh, maintaining the structural integrity and the property of reintegration. So thank you very much. I hope I was able to uh, address uh, these two questions uh, in a way. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Siddharth. You can probably stop sharing and... Yeah. Manesh, that was your last speaker? So... Just now we heard about uh, multiple uh, uses, and mainly uh, this this technique has been used or most useful for uh, the diaphyseal reconstructions. And I'm just going to share some of our cases where we have used it for uh, uh, options other than just diaphyseal reconstructions. Now, this is one case where our length of resection for a proximal femur osteosarcoma was, was very long. And if we had to save the distal uh, growth plate, we would have to uh, have a little more bone to be able to put a prosthesis. This case, the bone which we need was remounted after radiation. And here you can see we've used the plate to fix it. And then we've used the prosthesis on this. And this allowed us to get very good fixation. And this patient, as you can see in the video, has extremely good function. In the distal tibia, we've used this method combined with a fibula. This, this was a, a distal tibia osteosarcoma. You can see this was a big soft tissue mass on the posterior aspect of the distal tibia. Chemotherapy has been an extremely good response. The tumor mark, so we decided to resect the distal tibia. We've used it with a non-vascularized fibula into the defect, 
and we've put this construct back, held it with a plate. And within six months, these patients have been able to go back to good walking, the foot looks good. And why did we start using this ECRT with fibula for these tumors? Goes back to our history. Previously, for almost 10 years, we've used into the leaf. We found that actually takes a pretty long time to hypertrophy. Very often we see plate breakages. In fact, uh, they've been very common and it's it's a long time before the patient can actually be full weight bearing or go on to full activity involving sports or running. Whereas with this particular method, we've now done four cases. We've not had any non-unions or any breakdowns and in all the cases, uh, the patient has been off to full weight bearing in six months. We've not had to do a second operation. We've not had to change anybody's plates. And, and therefore, we feel that this, this was a very useful addition to this kind of reconstruction. The best use of the that we found is in osteoarthritis, particularly pelvis. And Lee Hayes uh, pointed out uh, good results, and this is a, a very similar case of osteosarcoma. Here, astabulum was involved, so you can see there has been a, a extraarticular resection because of which uh, we had to uh, resurface the joint. Normally, we don't resurface the joint, and I saw in these cases that they have been putting up prosthesis with the assumption that uh, the astabular cartilage would be dead and they would resurface it like this. But here, this resurfacing was done because uh, the joint was involved and these patients have to the logical method of reconstruction, muscle reattachment that we can get. Has been quite uh, superior, um, much better than compared to the other method of reconstruction that we have used, like the prosthesis or, or just doing a, a mesh plasty. Now, if, if the joint is not involved, like in this chondrosarcoma, we have just uh, put the astabulum back and we have not resurfaced it. You can see this with a single approach, we can, we can actually fix both the columns. And these heal very predictably. And this patient, you can see, can walk extremely well with very, very little limb or any support which is required. Nineteen games were twelve years of varying pathologies and of different age groups, and in almost all these cases, uh, I mean, most of our cases have been complete astabular resection. Some of them have been partial. We have done resurfacing only two of our cases. In all the other cases we have not resurfaced, and uh, in terms of results, we have not seen any infections, but we've had bolation which required us to the cycle both had any non-unions or dislocations and in six to ten months predictably the junction the astabular junction or the sacral junction united allowing us to put the patient or allow patient with full weight bearing there was one case there were two cases who got avascular necrosis as we expect and this is one example we were able to resurface this back and uh, this this was not a very different operation. We had uh, one other patient who had a little bit of thin joint narrowing, but three surgeries could function, but maybe were replacement for the diffuse function. Uh, for cases where we have a reasonably long follow-up. You can see this is an eight-year follow-up. Most of these cases have not shown much of a cartilage thinning, and their function still remains very good. Again, this is another patient with almost a six-year follow-up, and you can see even on the CT scans that the joint space has been maintained. So primarily, we don't resurface our hips because uh, uh, we believe that if we can buy some time before we do them one so wrong results, most of these patients uh, have had very good uh, functional scores, all independent ambulators. 
We've had two local recurrences, but there have been these soft tissues and there have been both uh, cordosarcomas which had undergone intralesional surgery before uh, they had presented to us for resection. We've also used osteoarticular reconstruction for the olecranon. This was a Ewing sarcoma and uh, again, post-chemotherapy, good response. Then we've done the resection, radiated. We have re-implanted it back uh, with all the ligaments. And you can see from the video that the function is good. The, we have a four-year follow-up for this patient. But the results are very stable and good. In three cases, and all these three cases, our results have been good. So just to summarize, we feel that uh, recycling bone using radiation is an excellent alternative to allograft. It can build you out of a lot of trouble. And in selected cases, I think the uh, osteoarticular reconstruction can be a huge benefit compared to the other options that are available to us. Thank you. We can probably now answer. Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> we can. We are going to read the questions that people have asked um, for for the different doctors. So. Uh, if you want to start, Valerie, please go ahead. Awesome. So it looks like we have a question from uh, Philip. Um, uh, magnificent results to AJ. When looking at outcomes and survivals, have you corrected for tumor size or can it be a bias? As in the tumors for our extracorporeal RT have been those with smaller soft tissue extension. That was a question from AJ. Actually, most of the questions have been answered on the chat. Do you want me to sort of articulate them all over again? Yes. So Philip's point is well taken. Now, this was a retrospective study, and the numbers were relatively small. And so we didn't do the size matching. And that's why we suggested that maybe a propensity-matched cohort with multi-centers and larger numbers could be the way forward if we were looking at seeing whether re-implanting bone would actually impact survival or not. Great. Thank you very much. We then have a question from, and I'm terrible with uh, pronunciation of names, Yugesh Hachua, to all the experts. What is advisable during ECRT, removing the tumor component before radiation or after radiation? What do you recommend? Siddharth, what would you recommend as a radiation oncologist? I mean, would there be any difference between whether you radiated the tumor before or after? So we, what we follow is that we strip the uh, bone of the soft tissue component. And you primarily what you do is you end up treating a smaller volume of uh, tissue. But if you ask me, is it really going to make a huge difference? The answer is no, because it's not going to be more than five centimeter or maybe eight centimeter in thickness that you are treating. So that could be easily and uniformly treated with your conventional radiation. So it's not going to make a huge difference, but it is always better to strip it off. Maybe you're treating a smaller volume of tumor there. I think one of the other points is, is that when, if you start to use um, irradiation and reimplantation uh, in your unit, then the one of the biggest things you'll get is your pathologist moaning that they don't get the uh, tumor sample. Um, so you need to make sure for us that we can give them as much tissue as possible. Um, and if you're resecting it widely, you can still measure those uh, margins. So Lee, what we do is uh, we send the soft tissue that we remove as well as the marrow scrapings. Yep. to the pathologist and we do this after the radiation and we have compared again uh, sending the sample before radiation and after radiation and, and then the pathologists can't tell whether this is a radiated specimen or not which means that the cells are just stunned yeah. I mean it does not uh, change this in person the evaluation is or uh, they can tell you whether there's a hundred percent necrosis from the soft tissue component. Most of the patients that we treat would have a soft tissue component. And when they don't have that, we are just sending them the marrow scrapings that we have from the tumor to just get a rough idea about what kind of response to chemotherapy we have had. 
margins of course we can't evaluate but uh, as ajay pointed out that we could take shave margins and send them separately ourselves and then we can be secure any tra- anywhere where the surgeon feels that the margin has been closed we can just sample those margins uh, separately and be assured that our margins have been free great thank you so much i i find that radiate radiating i mean remote is also afterwards is a little bit uh, useful because i don't contaminate my instruments i don't have to use a separate trolley and i'm not worried about uh, contaminating the field with the tumor so manish what i was trying to highlight is that from the technical point of view of delivering that radiation it doesn't make a difference but in my opinion it's a good idea of uh, stripping off the uh, bone of a soft tissue before we radiate so you get some information like you said looking at necrosis and the tumor responses uh, before you radiate okay. um well there's another couple of questions uh this one seems to be interesting it says after extracorporeal radiotherapy is there is still indication for radiotherapy of the patient or the tumor bed respectively with irradiated bone with stand that or not would it not impact the osteosarcoma for instance in pelvic ewing it's for all of the speakers so that's been one of our relative contraindications where if we anticipate post op radiation we actually don't schedule that patient for ecrd we would use alternative methods of reconstruction and one of the reasons is because giving a double dose of rt we are always worried on what would be the structural impact on the bone and as if you scroll down one of the last questions radiation induced sarcoma occurring later we've been fortunate we've never had it with the 50 gray that we've used but we don't want to risk a chance of giving it a double dose and sort of risking stuff like that so we don't do ecrd where we are anticipating post op radiation And so in I case what, for any Ajay reason if you have to radiate, then it can withstand. I mean, the bone will withstand the radiation. No, but Manish, but you get issues as I said regarding the, the structural integrity of the bone, which uh, deteriorates after a particular dose of radiation. So when we say 50 gray of radiation, we are actually comparing it with 25,000 centigray of radiation, which is a large dose. and you if you add another 50 gray so that's a lot of radiation that you have done so we so the integrity would be a problem j o l e so we haven't uh we have again the same thing if we plan to use radio therapy we won't use radiation reimplantation but we have given some cases radio therapy afterwards um it, it for reasons of either poor necrosis or, or poor margins in say for ewings um uh, but i think i did i think ideally you don't want to give it uh, any more but if you think logically you know we're doing it telling everybody that the tumor is dead so the bone uh, should be dead as well so the the, the the you know the chances of secondary irradiating induced tumors shouldn't shouldn't happen really if all the if all the cells are dead in it uh, we haven't seen any secondary um radiation induced carcinomas sarcomas okay Lee, um, i have a quick question so uh in your small series of patients who you did irradiate after what was the outcome of those patients what was the outcome of their bone Uh, I'd have to go back and look them up. I haven't looked them up in our series, but uh, I, I think we've only done it once or twice. But uh, I don't remember that they had any uh, more problems. But you know, I, I couldn't swear on it without going looking it back up. Okay, we do have a question that flows along with that. Um, it's to everyone, all the speakers. Does it matter in terms of fracture rate and resorption if you are irradiating flat bones with a thinner cortices versus long cortical bone? Maybe yeah. So uh, now, if you're talking of flat bones, for example, if it's the scapula, we really don't irradiate the scapula and put it back. We've not used ECRD for that. So our experience essentially has been with the cortical bones. We don't do it if it's the clavicle or the scapula or the fibula, for example. So I wouldn't really be able to answer that question. so if you look at the pelvis which is a flat bone i don't think we've had uh, much of a problem in the pelvis either or even even over a longer period of time so 
I, I don't know how the scapula would behave because again, I have not used uh, a, a irradiated scapula putting it back, but uh, I, maybe you could get resorption. And, and I think I've spoken to a few people who've used a scapula and that has been a, a problem. Sometimes the bone does get resorbed, especially in the central part of the scapula where the bone is extremely thin. So uh, maybe the frame of the scapula is just used to reattach the muscles and that's probably going to be the, the only use of that bone. So Rob, uh, Rob did a, uh, a case report on a scapula that seemed to work well, but as far as I know, that's the only one that we've done. Uh, but again, I think when the bone gets thin, you start to worry about it. I think Manish made a, uh, or AJ made good points earlier about the amount of weight bearing. So in my experience, the, the upper limb ones seem to do incredibly well. Um, so I don't know if it's a weight bearing thing as well. Great. There's, there's, there's another question, interesting question here. Uh, also to all the speakers, it's, any experience with growth factor, um, uh, with growth factor like BMP or others in these patients, or would you would you dare to use them? No, we've never used them. We, we don't even use them in allografts. We're too worried. No, we've not used and it because we haven't, not had, we haven't used them. For... They're not huge. So, and and most of the times, because it's a size match, you're putting the same bone back. You don't have any gaps. So, um, in cases where you don't have gaps, generally the union has not been an issue. It would be very unusual for the. We've used, we've experimented with at the diaphyseal junctions. We've had a little bit of union issues compared to metaphyseal. So, we initially thought that allografts would solve that. So, we used to put in morselized allograft. But when we evaluated our results over a longer period of time, it didn't make a difference. And that is why the suggestion that I made in my presentation, we found using a small second plate that gives compression and actually taking iliac crest autograph seems to have helped union. The numbers are small because this was only after our experience that we realized we are having a problem. So I wouldn't be able to assertively say, but that seems to help compared to not putting anything in the diaphyseal junctions. The metaphysicals are never a problem. I think we have time for one more question. It is 7.30, but um, uh, this is a question to all the speakers. What is the effect of the ECRT to growing bone? And if the margin of resection is involved with the tumor, do you modify your resection? I think one would take We've not had an issue with margins being positive. So I guess it's maybe luck, but we don't we haven't had that. And if you have to resect the physis and then radiate it, which we haven't done because that would again be a sort of relative contraindication, it's going to impact on bone. So this has essentially been intercalary. We have been able to save the physis. So we may have used different means of fixation, maybe just K wires in very young children so that we are not crossing the physial area when we are doing the fixation. But the resection has very rarely involved the physis. If it does, you lose the growth potential, obviously. I think um, we haven't used it at any times uh, with the physis, and it would be a contraindication for us because we would assume that the, the physial cartilage would die as well. I think what's very important for the audience is that uh, I'm sure all the speakers will say that we're not advocating this uh, technique for all cases. I think if you think that you are going to be concerned about your margins, then you really want to send the whole sample to the pathologist. And so we try to use this for cases, particularly in the diaphysis of the femur and the uh, tibia. Uh, and that we, we probably will go a little bit wider, if anything, with our resection margins than normal because we're a little bit uh, scared that we can't have the confirmation as good as normal from the pathologist. So I think you need to plan the cases very carefully. Well, it's 7.32, uh, so I want to thank all our speakers. It was an excellent, excellent presentation. Um, I also want to thank Juan, uh, Dr. Zuragaga, um, who is from SLAPME, as they co-sponsor our uh, webinars. Without him, we definitely... Um, could not bring it forward. So thanks again to Slap Me. And I want everyone to encourage them to join us in January. 
when Dr. Peter Stedman has organized an excellent uh, webinar on pediatrics and orthopedic oncology. Um, so at this point, I want to see if Juan uh, would like to say anything. And if not, I wish everybody a happy holidays. Thank you very much, Valerie. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you, Manesh. Excellent. Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. <laughs>